seeing God. To begin, I want to offer you a kind of coat hook for contemplation. So you might leave this retreat with a lot of questions about what contemplation really means, how it works. But the fact that it matters, even the fact that it is what you were made to do, that much I can prove to you, de fide. So you can hang your spiritual coat on this. St. Thomas Aquinas was canonized by John the 22nd, who was Pope from 1316 to 1334. And this Pope is well known for having held that when the saints die, they do not receive the beatific vision of the face of God. They have to wait until the last judgment for the beatific vision. So this prompted John's successor, Pope Benedict XII, to issue an important bull entitled Benedictus Deus. And in this constitution, which Benedict writes, is to remain in force forever, (laughs) the teaching is defined that the souls of all the saints who have departed this life do attain to beatitude. And Benedict goes on to explain what this means. He says the saints, quote, have seen and do see the divine essence with an intuitive vision and even face to face without the mediation of any creature by way of object of vision. Rather, the divine essence immediately manifests itself to them, plainly, clearly, and openly. And in this vision, they enjoy the divine essence. Moreover, by this vision and enjoyment, the souls of those who have already died are truly blessed and have eternal life and rest. Also, the souls of those who will die in the future will see the same divine essence and will enjoy it before the general judgment. Such a vision and enjoyment of the divine essence do away with the acts of faith and hope in these souls, inasmuch as faith and hope are properly theological virtues. And after such intuitive and face-to-face vision and enjoyment has or will have begun for these souls, The same vision and enjoyment has continued and will continue without any interruption and without end until the last judgment and from then on forever. So John the 22nd's early teaching was uh, thoroughly refuted. Now for anyone who's worried maybe about what this meant for Pope John the 22nd, you can rest assured that he is not only not a heretic, because this was defined after his death, But he also later changed his position during his life. But the vision of the divine essence, this is a solemn definition of the faith that can guide us today. The saints see the divine essence with an intuitive vision and even face to face, Benedict XII said. The life of happiness to which we are called, the beatitude of heaven, for which we are made, consists in seeing the divine essence. The saints see the invisible God plainly, clearly, and openly, and without the mediation of any creature by way of object of vision. So we know this by divine faith, but to know this is to inherit several intellectual puzzles. To see the invisible God What could that mean? To see after death, that is, without any physical eyes. What could that mean? Are these activities of vision and enjoyment, which we undertake even now in our embodied life, ever become clear to us in this life? St. Thomas Aquinas taught that the vision of the divine essence is our happiness. But as you may already know, the teaching of St. Thomas in general was challenged in almost every way in the last century. One charge laid at St. Thomas's door is very serious, that he didn't take the Trinity as God. He didn't take the Trinity seriously enough in his theology. And so some would say, with St. Thomas, we wind up with a divine essence instead of the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the two are not opposed. 
Each of the divine persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, is the divine essence. We don't see essences with our eyes. Seeing, in this context, means to understand. The word intuitive, used by Benedict XII, somehow captures both sight and understanding. In a nutshell, this is what Aquinas says about seeing God. We understand, according to our nature, by means of sensible forms, perceptual species. When we die, our rational souls separate from our sensing bodies, and we lose the ability to understand in this way through sensible forms. But for the blessed, at death, God gives a special grace to see him by means of participating directly in a higher form by grace. Someone could think that this form is a kind of spiritual image of God, an image by which we understand God more fully than we ever did in this life. But St. Thomas says that that's not the case. It's not some image. No created form, however spiritual, substitutes for what the soul longs for as its final end. What the soul sees is God himself. This requires both a participation in the divine form, so taking part in God's own form, his being, and also a divine light, a light by means of which to see this divine form. God provides both of these so that the human soul may see the divine nature. And, St. Thomas says, quote, the soul in that state understands by means of participated species or forms arising from the influence of the divine light, shared by the soul as by other separate substances, angels, though in a lesser degree. Hence, as soon as it ceases to act, by turning to corporeal phantasms, or sensible forms, the soul turns at once to the superior things. Nor is this way of knowledge unnatural, for God is the author of the influx of both the light of grace and the light of nature. So you may like the sound of that as Thomistic Institute people, but some people don't like the sound of that. For instance, the Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar thought that a personal relationship with God must not be obscured by some abstract notion of the divine essence. He didn't like the idea of a divine essence or a participated form taking the place of God in person. So essence. If you're unfamiliar with the term essence, it simply means what a thing is, its being. Think of the verse from 1 John chapter 3. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So a medieval person like myself, hearing this, will think that it refers to God's essence. We will see him as he is. We will see him in what he is. But this important, influential theologian, von Balthasar, reads the verse differently. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, which must refer not to God's essence, but to his personal exchange of love. Von Balthasar thinks that we must not miss out on the personal relationship with God that he establishes with us. Today, there's a prominent Protestant theologian, another Hans, Hans Bursma, who has in some ways taken up Hans Urs von Balthasar's attack. But for Hans Bursma, St. Thomas has created a specific problem with relation to the face of Jesus Christ. So the face of Jesus as opposed to seeing the divine essence. So Bursma writes, the beatific vision, on my understanding of it at least, is first and foremost a Christological doctrine. 
Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus says to Philip in John 14. In no way does the beatific vision take us beyond Jesus Christ. To be sure, some in the Christian tradition may not have accented appropriately the Christological character of the beatific vision. Particularly, it seems to me problematic to substitute the essence of God for the incarnate Christ as the object of our eternal vision. It seems to me problematic to substitute the essence of God for the incarnate Christ as the object of our eternal vision. Here I have in mind particularly St. Thomas Aquinas and the tradition that follows from him, which links the beatific vision to the essence of God. The result, I think, is that Christology has become insufficiently central to the doctrine of the beatific vision. On my understanding, to see Christ is to see the essence of God. So I remember the first time I heard something like this, except it came from a Thomist. He told me that many contemporary theologians want us to be more Christological, to take Christ as our starting point, and that, in fact, St. Thomas, even in his own time, rather than being one of these Christocentric theologians, was something different. He was theocentric. So St. Thomas, instead of putting Christ front and center in his manner, his order of presentation, begins and ends with God. For Aquinas, Christ is first of all the Savior, He came to save his people from their sins, and he is, in fact, something to be contemplated, to be gazed at. But what about this question? Is seeing God nothing other than seeing Christ? In one sense, of course, Jesus is Lord. He is God the Son. To see Jesus is to see God, according to a human nature. But what does it mean to see Jesus in other senses? What does it mean to see the Father, to see the Spirit? To add a further complexity, we have to consider the fact that our papal definition, solemn and certain and perpetual as it is, does not directly concern any of us now. In this life, we neither see Jesus nor do we see the divine essence. And furthermore, there were many who did see Jesus and apparently didn't think too much of him. They saw Jesus, and they saw a man, a poor and unimportant or even insane man. So we have to ask, what is so great about seeing? About seeing Jesus, but also about seeing anything. And what does it have to do with being a good person or being a saint? How does holiness make a way for vision? A holy life purifies us. Holiness of life restores human nature to an integrity and even a glory that was lost to us. But its ancient form remains inscribed in our hearts, such that when we see a holy person, we might recollect a lost, deep happiness. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Purity is a kind of restoration of the power of sight. So purity, along with all the virtues that confirm pure actions, gives us a right orientation to the world. This world that God created is good. Everything that God created is good. But that's not a simply innocent idea. Goodness is dangerous. People want good things. And this causes envy, it causes temptation, not only joy, but also competition, scarcity. And these cause murder and war. So all these things are rooted in the fact that creation is good, but that we do not have pure dispositions towards it. 
Purity, the power of the virtuous soul to see the world for what it is and what it's for, gives us peace with our brother and sanctity before God. It belongs to a good will. Purity belongs to a good will. And isn't a good will enough? Is there anything better than a good will? Immanuel Kant didn't think so. Why should we look for happiness beyond a good will? Who says that there is some heavenly vision which is better than simple moral goodness? Some would say contemptuously, a pie in the sky. St. Thomas and the ancient Christians saw that purity is not an end in itself, but rather that it leads to vision, or it disposes us toward contemplation. This insight came from a dual source. First and most important is sacred scripture. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessedness or happiness is the reward of purity in scripture. So the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, where we hear this, blessed are the pure of heart. For St. Thomas, these Beatitudes describe the acts of a human being in this life which merit and which even begin to dispose us to happiness in the next life. So Thomas is emphatic that the Beatitudes are not happiness themselves, even if they describe happiness completely in terms of our final end. In the Beatitude about the pure of heart, St. Thomas says, quote, The opinion of those who say that Beatitude consists in the contemplation of divine things is condemned by the Lord, but only as to the timing. Otherwise, it is true, because the last happiness does consist in the vision of the best intelligible, namely God. Hence, he says, they will see. End quote. The acts of moral virtue, in other words, dispose us to the final act of happiness. The act of happiness is, quote, the vision of the best intelligible. And this brings us to the second source of the idea of vision, ancient Greek philosophy. For both Plato and Aristotle, the power of reason is our highest and most distinctive power. It defines us. Its operation can reach up and into a divine, immortal life. To contemplate what is true, not only on earth, but also in heaven, is what makes a human being fully alive. For Plato, it unites us to a world of true reality, beyond this lesser reality. For Aristotle, it is a divine and godlike activity, energeia, a wisdom about first things. The matter is complex, but St. Thomas proposes a fairly brief resolution of how this teaching about contemplative vision meshes with the philosophers. And this is long, so I put it on your handout um, so that it's less boring to hear. If you look at the first quote, beginning on the fourth line, now since the perfection. Excuse me, beginning on the second line, since understanding. So this is how St. Thomas briefly reconciles what he thinks with the philosophers. Since understanding is an operation most proper to man, it follows that his happiness must be held to consist in that operation when perfected in him. Now, since the perfection of an intelligent being as such is the intelligible object, if in the most perfect operation of his intellect, man does not attain to the vision of the divine essence, but to something else, we shall be forced to conclude that something other than God is the object of man's happiness. And since the ultimate perfection of a thing consists in its being united to its principle, source, it follows that something other than God is the effective principle of man, which is absurd according to us, and also according to the philosophers who maintain that our souls emanate from the separate substances, the forms, so that finally we may be able to understand these substances. 
Consequently, according to us, it must be asserted that our intellect, our intellect will at length attain to the vision of the divine essence. For the Christian, a number of questions arise in this presentation. First, do we really have the power to contemplate God? Should we be so bold as to say that we can see God? This may be an illusion of pride or an error about our likeness to God. For medieval Christians, the monastic writer, Pseudo Dionysius, phrased this kind of problem best. Here is St. Thomas using Dionysius to frame an objection to the vision of the divine essence. So this is St. Thomas quoting Dionysius. He says, Dionysius says in his epistle to Gaius that the darkness, for thus he calls the abundance of light, which screens God, is impervious to all illuminations and hidden from all knowledge. And if anyone in seeing God understood what he saw, he saw not God himself, but one of those things that are his. Therefore, no created intellect will be able to see God in his essence. So this is Thomas using Dionysius to frame an objection to seeing the divine essence. And in terms of scripture, you might think of Ezekiel, the visions of Ezekiel, where you're always seeing something like the form of a man, something like a son of man, the likeness of the glory of the splendor, etc., etc., removal, something that belongs to God, but not God himself. But where Dionysius' manner of speaking poses questions, an equal or even greater authority provides help. St. Augustine, especially in his De Videndo Dei, or On Seeing God. Augustine is equally sensitive to the problem of human capacity to see God, but he gives priority to the fact that the scriptures say that it is so. So, you can look at the beginning of that first quote. St. Thomas says, It is in contradiction to the authority of canonical scripture, as Augustine declares, on seeing God. That's the first principle. The Bible says that we're going to see God. Augustine believed that seeking the face of the Lord is our task, and that laying hold of him in heaven is our joy. In particular, the Psalms led Augustine on the quest to see the face of God. To take three psalms kind of at random. Of you my heart has spoken, seek his face. It is your face, O Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face. The upright shall see his face. In my justice I shall see your face, and be filled when I awake with the sight of your glory. Yet another point of contrast among theologians, however, is what happens when the vision of God is reached, when we see the face of God. What happens then? And St. Gregory of Nyssa proposed a dynamic idea of contemplation that is very attractive to some people today. This is truly perfection, he says, never to stop growing towards what is better and never placing any limit on perfection. God's infinite goodness allows for perpetual striving, straining forward and pressing ahead, to borrow the language of St. Paul in Philippians. But a more Augustinian notion, one which St. Thomas follows, is that of rest. I don't want to overplay the contrast between Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine, or pretend that they're saying the same thing. There is a contrast there. But St. Thomas and much of the Western tradition, including that document from Benedict XII, mention rest. So some compare rest unfavorably to movement. Movement is dynamic and lively. Rest is static, dead. Suffice it to say that I don't find this objection compelling. Rest that is found in the contemplation of God is not a lazy rest. It's like the rest of a wedding day, a rest in love, which is the culmination of struggle and anticipation. Contemplative rest is the fruition of suffering, salvation, 
escape, discovery, and reunion. To look upon this rest as restrictive seems to me like looking at a happy marriage as restrictive. It's the immature longing of the swinger, looking with incomprehension at a family chattering around the hearth. These are some of the main contours of the question of contemplation for theology, which I present to you for your rumination during this retreat. Is God beyond your grasp and too great for your mind? Yes. But he has made you for himself, and his grace will supply what is lacking to your nature. Yet many of you have come to find out not what you're going to contemplate when you die, but how to contemplate now, how to begin contemplating God now, today, maybe tomorrow. (laughs) Can we see the face of God now? If not, what are we looking for here on earth? The scriptures present Moses as seeing God already face to face. And the medievals considered the same question with respect to St. Paul and his rapture. It would seem that, at least for a privileged few, God becomes truly visible even in this life. Is this an ordinary state or a special rapture only for the few? This question touches on a debate concerning Gregory Palamas, a late Byzantine theologian who has influenced much of Orthodox theology today. I haven't read Gregory Palamas myself, and I should say I'm I'm borrowing a lot from Hans Bersma, Uh, who has a good book called Seeing God, which is uh, anti-Thomist, but it's a good resource. Gregory Palamas proposes a strong notion of our grasp of the divine nature even in this life. So those who follow Thomas Aquinas believe that a special grace is required to see God, and that is a created participation, something created by God, which makes our nature apt to behold God's form according to the limitations of our nature. But Palamas thought that by distinguishing between God's essence and his energies, we could affirm that we lay hold of an uncreated grace, God himself, though not his essence. His essence remains beyond. His energies, on the other hand, are accessible. And the difference appears in how we interpret Jesus' transfiguration on Mount Tabor. So St. Thomas saw the light on the face of Jesus at the transfiguration as the light of glory overflowing in his humanity. But this light was a privileged glimpse given to the apostles and would prepare them for the passion. So it was not a normal thing to see when you see Jesus. Therefore, our life is not a seeking after this earthly kind of revelation. Rather, this is the light of heaven, the light of glory, which we're only anticipating now. Gregory Palamas, however, saw it as an outpouring of divine light, which we can partake of. The divine energies are accessible to us, and so our contemplation of God, as far as it is possible, can begin even now. So Burzma is helpful here. He says, Palamas has led many theologians to read into the Eastern tradition a distinction between essence and energies that might not be so prominent in the church fathers as many say. That this later idea of essence and energies is a more drastic distinction than it was in, say, Gregory of Nyssa. So Burzma agrees with Palamas and against St. Thomas, that we should seek a present vision of the face of Christ. He thinks that we should look for the face of Christ in the sacraments, the scriptures, and in life. And as I said before, as opposed to the divine essence. But Bersma points out that, at least for Gregory of Nyssa, the distinction between essence and energies does not serve the same purpose as in Palamas. So, energy is a word coined, apparently, by Aristotle, energeia, uh, being at work, as 
er erg in it, like ergonomic. So work. And it can be taken simply as something's being what it is in an actual way rather than in a potential way. So in God, this is not a real distinction. God in act just is God. God is pure act. So God's energia is his essence. St. Thomas certainly saw God as present in the world, but in different ways. He's not yet present to our vision. We live now by faith. And the sacred signs which Christ governs in this world, Christ exerts his power over sacred signs, exert their power through that faith. In the Eucharist, Christ has left even himself, but his visible form is hidden under another visible form. We live in him, but our graced vision in faith has not yet attained to the glory of his face. Leaving aside some of these difficult disagreements between East and West, I'd like to end with a Syriac spiritual work by an anonymous author. In the Syriac Liber Graduum, or the Book of Steps, we learn that what we see here matters, but it is not all of what we will see. However, we already have a share in what we do not see. The church in heaven. We have a share in the church in heaven, both through the church on earth and also through what the author calls in the most famous phrase of this work, the little church of the heart. This is the second and final quotation on your handout. Those who keep these commandments and who are born again are like the wind that blows where it wills. That is, they are in heaven with our Lord, and there is no power that can overcome them, because they have conquered in the fighting without in that they have no strife or battle with humanity. And they have discarded the fear within that they only fight against sin and not against their brothers, the sons of Adam, even if the latter kill them. Therefore, they have delivered their will and liberty from him who wants to subject them to slavery. They see the Lord himself in the spirit, in this world as in a mirror. And when they have departed from their bodies, they will see him face to face, as from glory to glory. For they close their eyes and shut their ears to wickedness, seeing the king in his beauty in distant lands. Thank you.